Yeah, we are Diffmuse. Uh, so our team is Alston, Lowe, Elliot Schreider, Walter Merjo, and uh, Anatoly Zavialov. All right. So our the motivation of our project is for composers to have an aid that they can input some uh, part of their composition, some melody idea that they have, and have a model essentially fill in the remainder of that melody or suggest new ideas. Um, this isn't a real example. This is Chopin's Ballade Number no. Three, but this is sort of the uh, the vision we had when we were starting off. Hello, I'm Walter. Um, so, um, our problem that we are trying to solve, um, or I guess what we're trying to do um, with Diff News is uh, generate classical polyphonic piano music in MIDI format. So basically uh, multiple lines of melody um, and on a temporal level, as in like when a note is pressed and how long a note is pressed. So uh, this time is not in uh, beats or anything, it's in pure um, milliseconds, for example. Um, so we, we don't have time signatures or tempo or any of that stuff. Um, it's just the time the note was pressed and how long it was pressed. Um, and our model has focused uh, on unconditional generation, uh, meaning just from a blank canvas, canvas uh, just generate a piece of music um, for, for this fixed amount of time. Though uh, we just mentioned that um, we wanted to complete a composition, um, we'll show later that it's possible to create a post hoc uh, conditional generation out of a model that does unconditional generation like Diffney's. And um, so some related works here um, that we've been looking at while making um, dip news. Uh, we have the Music Transformer uh, work by Mittal uh, and SD Muse. And uh, what we're, I guess our ultimate goal is to dethrone the Music Transformer as the state of the art music generation model and we plan to do a listening study um, with uh, with people and um, uh, calculate metrics on our music, which we will also uh, go into depth very soon. Um, so now I'll provide some details about uh, our approach. So we train on the Maestro dataset. So this is a data set of about 200 hours of paired audio and MIDI recordings from 10 years of uh, a piano competition. And basically, I think they use a special piano to uh, record when notes are played and they have actual performers playing. Uh, so importantly, the data from the Maestro data set isn't really annotated with things like tempo or beat, as Walter said earlier, uh, but the MIDI files that come out of it are uh, very high accurate uh, have very high accuracy um, next slide uh, for our architecture we use a diffusion model um, this is a very popular type of generative model that has achieved state of the art in especially the computer vision field uh, at a very high level a diffusion model uh, it iteratively noises samples and then it learns to reverse the process and by reversing the process, you can basically create structured examples from a uh, complete random noise. And as for architecture, we draw from some of the recent state space literature, which has provided these layers that are uh, capable of very long range sequence modeling uh, at uh, very scalable um, complexities. And so, in terms of our actual data representation, we diffuse over uh, these note arrays. And basically a note array is this sequence of notes where each note is represented by four values, the pitch of the note, the volume, uh, the duration, as well as the delay. And delay of a note is basically the offset time from when the note is played 
in comparison to the preceding node. And we found that this data representation worked much better than something like uh, a raw piano roll. It's definitely much more compressed and we were able to get better uh, quality samples from using it. Yeah, so as uh, Walter alluded to uh, earlier, um, we can use a unconditionally trained diffusion model uh, to do post hoc conditional generation. And uh, basically the algorithm that we used is one from uh, one of the related works. Um, and I won't go into the details of the algorithm, but um, essentially uh, we can sort of modify the uh, reverse, uh, the denoising process uh, that the model was trained for and modified in such a way that we can sort of mask out one part of a sample and then have it filled in um, by using this algorithm. And so if you want to like either infill, so if you have a part in the middle of the piece that you want to generate some variation, you can do that. Uh, or um, yeah, we can also sort of try and apply this to a continuation. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about uh, metrics. So uh, it comes to metrics for music models. They're has not been sort of much research in this. Uh, there aren't standard sort of metrics that uh, that papers use. If you look at some of the related works, they all use uh, something sort of different, or they may focus on uh, listening studies um, or just some very basic metrics. Uh, in fields like computer vision, we have things like Frisch inception distance or inception score, which are these uh, very good metrics that are independent of uh, data representation, independent of the model architecture, uh, which are supposed to assess the quality of, say, like an uh, image generation model. And uh, similarly, in NLP, we have uh, something like blue score for assess assessing quality of translations. Uh, and uh, in, our, in particular, uh, one of the metrics that some previous music models have generated is the uh, negative log likelihood, which we can't produce with our model. Uh, diffusion models uh, can't produce that. So uh, we've found difficulty comparing two previous models uh, since that was one of the main metrics that they were using. Um, and it's just sort of hard to find metrics that, you know, capture the mu musicality of a piece and doing so quantitatively. Um, and uh, but there are some, the, there has been a little bit of work uh, in this, which I'll talk about now. Um, and so uh, essentially there are a couple of papers about uh, trying to develop some metrics for music models. Uh, this is sort of uh, the main one uh, that, uh, that we found to be the most impactful. Uh, it's from this paper on the evaluation of generative models in music. And so what this model does, uh, what this uh, paper does quite well is it gives a bunch of absolute metrics. Uh, so meaning things that you can, uh, musical related things that you can calculate on a piece like pitch count, meaning like how many different pitches were used in this piece. Uh, you can have the average pitch interval. So like between two consecutive notes, what's the average uh, interval pitch range, meaning like uh, what was the highest pitch minus the lowest pitch? So how much uh, were, did the pitches vary in the piece? There are also similar metrics for like note length. Um, and uh, we also have uh, we also uh, use some for volume as well. Uh, another one that's quite interesting is the, this pitch class transition matrix. So I've included an image here from uh, that paper. Pitch class transition matrix basically uh, gives you probabilities of uh, transitioning from one pitch to another pitch. So like uh, from, so if your current pitch is E, or this is, yeah, for pitch class. So that means we don't, we're not worrying about which octave we're in. It's just, uh, yeah, which of the 12 pitch classes. So if the current note is a D, what's the probability that the next note is a, an F? And you could uh, look at this uh, matrix and or that would be represented by a probability in this matrix. Um, and then the important part is that uh, we can use these to generate relative metrics because these raw numbers alone don't uh, allow you to compare two music models really because you know, what does it mean to like, there's no such thing as a good pitch count or whatever, like it's better to have higher or lower. That's, uh, you know, so we can't directly compare models using these. Uh, so on the next slide, um, I'll describe sort of how this paper moves towards relative uh, metrics. 
And so there's a, essentially a process, uh, which is, so we take one of these absolute metrics, say pitch class. And uh, what we do is for, so what we can do is uh, we can generate histograms. So you'll see the, that the, there's a bunch of uh, lines in this uh, diagram. And so uh, what we can do is like for each pair of uh, data points in the training data, uh, so like for the pitch count for each piece and the training data, we can compute like Euclidean distance and get like a histogram of distances. And then we can uh, approximate that by like a Gaussian. Uh, we can also do that for the, uh, for if we're trying to compare two music models, we can perform that process with computing like pairwise distances for one of these absolute metrics between model one and the training data and then also approximate a distribution and then also do that for the second model. So uh, if you see here, uh, the distributions I'm talking about is you'll see this red line in the diagram uh, was sort of a, a distribution now that represents uh, one of our metrics for the training data. And then we have the green and the blue one, which are supposed to represent distributions for the two models. Uh, and on the next slide, uh, I'll explain how basically you get metrics out of this. So we can compute the similarity between uh, the models. So we, we have a distribution for model one and model two and one for the training set. And so we can compute the KL divergence and the overlapping area between the model one distribution in the training set and the model two distribution in the training set. And the idea is that if uh, these distributions are more similar, then it means that uh, that model one basically ma matches sort of the musicality of the, like what should be contained in the training set uh, for and we do this for each of those absolute metrics um, and so uh, in this diagram here you'll see like uh, we have basically the um, yeah we so it's called sort of the intraset the difference like between the training set examples and then we have uh, for the mo first model the intraset is referring to the difference between it and the training set which is sort of the um, one of the distributions we use and then for the second model also the interset you could ignore the intraset for the two models um and then so what we're computing here is you see in the diagram the kale divergence in the overlapping area so in this example the uh overlapping area is higher for the second model uh it's like 0 0.5 instead of 0 0.1 which is better and the kale divergence is also lower um the paper explains in more detail why they use both of these uh, there are some some scenarios where overlapping area can capture uh, differences better than KL divergence can. Uh, but so in this scenario, we would say that MIDI net two uh, in this comparison is better uh, than MIDI net one. All right, now we're going to play some samples. So we have a uh, we have the piano roll right beside the sample. So hopefully uh, the audio will be audible. sample it was kind of a lot of counterpoint kind of like a fugue right, let's listen to the second one Third one. Thank you. 
and the final one. So after listening to these four samples, uh, they, have pretty they have pretty coherent musical ideas and they stay within a certain key. So they don't veer off. And most importantly, they have a, uh, they, it's not mentioned on the slide, but these samples can actually be played by a person. So here you can clearly see that it's two hands playing. Uh, here you have some chords that can be played with, well, two hands. And so this seems a bit less uh, realistic, but this you could still play if you have some pedals and stuff going on. Uh, and we have a fairly consistent tempo in all of these samples, and they also have pretty expressive dynamics. So if you're wondering what the differences in color here are, uh, these, these uh, more, more colder colors indicate quieter, while the warmer colors indicate uh, louder notes. Uh, and I, we picked these samples because they gener they demonstrate a variety of different musical styles. So as I mentioned, this first sample is a bit more, uh, a bit more Baroque, a bit more, you have a lot more counterpoint. Uh, this second sample was a bit, I actually don't know how to, how to describe this one. Third one was a bit more classical and the very last one with the big chords was much more romantic and much more expressive. Uh, as, as you've probably heard, it sounds a little bit choppy at times, and it does tend to forget what it was doing, and um, it also sound, can be sometimes a bit messy, and there's a little bit of inconsistency in quality. So we did cherry pick these. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? So we'll have an ask. Uh, I see a question uh, yeah. about um, could you explain the state space model more? Uh, I think it's quite hard to explain it concisely, but I can direct you towards like a repository that contains all the relevant papers. Uh, one second. Uh, maybe can I ask? Uh... What kind of difficulties did you guys encounter a lot in this uh, in this project? I think a major difficulty was uh, getting the re data representation right as well as the um, the model right. Uh, we tried a bunch of stuff, and uh, funnily enough, like the, the simplest thing worked in the end. Um, are the samples generated, uh, the, the samples we showed here are generated unconditionally, uh, but the model does have the capacity to do conditional generation. Uh, any specific reason you chose the classical genre? Sure, I think I the can... classical genre, oh, yeah. Uh, you can sure, take yeah. this note. I can answer that one. Um, yeah, I think uh, we chose the classical genre because it's, uh, well, we wanted to like uh, originally like make sure to sort of restrict our what we were producing enough so that we could uh, have a better chance of having a more successful model. We did think about like wanting to expand uh, as like we progressed, but with classical, uh, particularly piano music, there's like more availability of classical and it's like quite structured uh, and. Uh, yeah, the availability of like data sets for other kinds of music could be more varied. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I would like to add to with classical music, some of these pieces like 
they're quite complex. So I think it's also interesting to aim for this genre. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there's uh, another question about added a uh, metric to evaluate human playability. Um, yeah, we haven't done so uh, yet. I mean, it would be uh, probably somewhat difficult to even, uh, you know, come up with some sort of like way to structure that into the loss uh, because you can't just simply do like how many notes are played simultaneously because you can, if you use pedals and whatnot, you can have very like a very large number of notes like uh, ringing can, at the same time. So it's very difficult to, and generally like uh, it, it can do more harm than good to impose like extra constraints like that on the model. Uh, if you just, uh, because you know, the model, the data that's traded on at the end of the day is all from human playable pieces. And so as the model, if your model is, reflecting that more and more accurately as you progress, then it, that should naturally happen. I think there's probably more harm than good to, that can happen by like adding that in. Um, and because we've thought about this before with other things about like adding an extra, like accoutrement to like the loss or whatnot to try and when we were having difficulties, uh, having better sounding samples, but more often than not, it was the better approach was to do less and just focus on like having a stronger uh, model, just like without actually messing with the loss. Um, I think, yeah, the applications of the project. Um, so yeah, our initial one is to, uh, or the one we mentioned at the beginning is to be like a compositional aid. So if you have a, if you're a musician or a composer and you're writing a song and you're stuck or whatever, then you could use a model like this to generate uh, some potential, you know, continuations uh, of your piece. And, you know, that might inspire some creativity. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we've thought about if this would be useful and like at some, once we're sort of, um, we have completed uh, our model, uh, like to the point where we think we're absolutely done, then we've thought about if, like making it yeah, you, creating some sort of uh, uh, app or application or something where someone could actually use that. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, and that's the, yeah, I see that that would be the, the last question that appears. Yeah, because I think uh, the next group has to go now. But yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Elliot, and thank you, the team of Diff News. It's a wonderful, wonderful project, and I believe you guys may be submitting or continuing the project. So, wishing you guys all the best to any future endeavors or publications, perhaps.